thank you all for joining. Today we're looking at the FCC Ministry Canada updates as they were presented at the TCB workshop last month. Um, so we'll start with FCC and then go into Industry Canada um, after that. So starting off, just some of the um, key points in terms of KDB publications. Um, there have been uh, quite a few rule changes in the past uh, two years, and so the FCC have been performing an extensive review of all of their knowledge database publications, which are the which form part of the FCC um, rules that need to be met. And a lot of changes have, uh, in fact, resulted from their um, notice of proposed rulemaking that was um, implemented in their equipment authorization order that was released at the end of last year. Some draft publications that have been released for comment are listed below, including medical body area networks, which we'll look at later, um, for TCBs and manufacturers of interest, grant note conditions and comments, KDB has been released as a draft, um, trying to sort of have a uniform way and guidance for TCBs and manufacturers on what should be um, listed on grants. LED lighting products, KDB is released as well as draft. Um, TCB roles and responsibilities was a significant um, sort of release. And the UNII 5 gigahertz um, a test procedure um, for DFS as well. Some KDB publications have also been updated just due to terminology and changes in the um, equipment authorization order include some general publications that are key, including the permissive change policy, um, where you'll see there is a revised um, policy that has significantly a lot more detail in it, but also there's a second document that has been released along with it that has um, some useful information. There's a KDB on change in FCC ID um, as well, and pre-approval guidance KDB, which replaces the permit but ask um, KDB, which um, in terms of content and um, procedure remains the same, but the terminology has changed from the um, permit but ask to pre-approval guidance. There is a module guidance KDB 996369, which has also been updated, um, which we'll look at later. For RF exposure, there's also a review been performed and um, some updates to the public, various publications for that. So first, we'll start by looking at the um, FCC's um, equipment authorization program, a sort of a summary of the um, first and second notice of proposed rulemakings, um, which was presented in 2012, uh, June 2012 at a commission meeting. Um, just to give you an idea, the first NPRM um, addressed primarily TCB obligations where they had to, um, they proposed to refine and codify the permit but ask procedure into the rules, which now is actually the pre-approval guidance procedure. They also, in the rules, now include um, the, the rules for market surveillance for post-grant checks um, in terms of TCB obligations, and also a requirement that test laboratories are carrying out testing for FCC certification um, is performed by accredited laboratories, and also in the notice of proposed rulemaking, they um, wanted to recognize the latest industry testing standards, um, primarily from ANSI. In the um, apologies, second notice of proposed rulemaking that was just recently um, released addresses the administrative procedures and in this, they are looking at merging different self-approval procedures, which is the um, DOC and verification procedures. They also propose to modify some permissive change regulations and the rules for software-defined radio. Some rules around radio um, rules, such as modules, et cetera, are also clarified. And also, modular transmitters for license services has never been um, highly regulated or outlined, and so that is also um, addressed in the second notice of proposed rulemaking. 
So looking at it in a little bit more detail, we first look at part one, the equipment authorization um, report and order that was released um, initially February 15, 2013, which was adopted in December 2014 and released um, later that month on the 30th. We'll look at the effective dates of that on the next slide. But the major topics that were covered by the order included um, the TCB program, rules for test laboratories, um, site validation requirements, measurement procedures, and um, also covered, of course, the transition periods that would be applicable. And the order became effective July 13, 2015. And after July 12, 2015, the FCC um, authorization applications would not be um, handled at the FCC and all up authorizations would need to be carried out by TCBs. Requests for labs who want a new 2.948 lab listing are no longer accepted by the FCC. And after July 13, 2016, all recognized 2.948 listed test firms would be um, expired, so there would be an expectation that laboratories would be um, accredited for those labs who wish to continue um, testing for certification purposes. Um, also, they require the use of ANSI C63.4 2014 and C63.10 2013, the latest ANSI standards um, to be used. And from October 12, 2016, um, they, they allowed a, a couple more months um, the transition period, so after October 12, 2016, they stop accepting test reports from 2.94 it listed only labs. Um, and from October 13, they required test firms doing testing for FCC certification to meet the new site validation requirements as well for radiated emissions testing above one gigahertz. So those are the, the key transition periods um, for the initial NPRM. In relation to that order, there are a couple of petitions for reconsideration that are out there, um, including one from the TIA, Motorola Solutions, and the FCC has released a public notice on October 22nd where they have received comments and replied comments to petitions as well. So that's still um, in progress. There have been some um, similar petitions for clarification and reconsideration on the order. Um, requesting clarification on the procedures for the recognition of accreditation bodies that can accredit test labs in non-MRA countries. There's also been a request for a two-year transition instead of a one-year transition period for labs that are currently non-accredited in order to allow them time to complete the process for accreditation. For the order, the FCC is updating several KDBs that are impacted. They are doing a review of the KDB publications um, and developing, um, which will be quite useful, an index of KDB publications, as there are several um, of them that have been published over the years. Part two, there was a second notice of proposed rulemaking that was released on July 21st, 2015, which update the rules that govern the evaluation and approval of radio frequency devices. The comments for the second NPRM were due October 9th and the reply comments due November um, 9th. And that addresses amendments of part 01, 215 and 18 of the FCC rules around RF equipment and request for the allowance of optional electronic labeling for wireless devices. We are going to look at on the next couple of slides some of the key items that are addressed in that second notice of proposed rulemaking. The first being what they refer to as an FDOC, Supplier's Declaration of Conformity Authorization. This is where they're proposing to combine the Declaration of Conformity and verification authorization routes into one product self-approval program referred to as Supplier's Declaration of Conformity, or SDOC. 
These would be used for equipment that has a strong record of compliance and for which there is minimal risk of harmful interference, which is typically Part 15B and some Part 18 devices. Um, they do, in the notice, um, outline the um, guidance in relation to the required documentation. The use of the FCC logo is also, um, is also um, proposed, the labeling requirements, and a requirement for test laboratory qualifications and the use of an accredited test laboratory. They also look to address for modules uh, the responsible party clarifying the responsibilities for compliance when a final product may be comprised of one or more certified modular transmitters. Um, for example, cases where a certified module is um, installed in a host and when no certification is required or if there is additional certification required, so they've outlined some general guidance for host manufacturers integrating modules and module manufacturers. Also proposing rules for modification of certified equipment by a third party. Also some rules around repair and refurbishment of the devices and import rules. For confidentiality, they're looking to codify existing practices that protect the confidentiality of market-sensitive information. For short-term confidentiality, it's by default um, going to be uh, upon the applicant's request for 45 days, can be extended with serial requests to a maximum of 180 days, and immediately end short-term confidentiality if the device is marketed to the public or publicized by the applicant or by an entity acting on the applicant's behalf prior to the expiration of this period. The short-term confidentiality can be automatically granted for some or all exhibits without being specifically requested by the applicant. For long-term confidentiality, they propose to automatically and indefinitely withhold from the public inspection the schematic, block diagrams, operational description, and parts list tune-up information. For e-label, this was another significant part of the, um, the rulemaking proposal. The e-label act required the commission by August 26, 2015, to um, allow manufacturers of devices with a display the option to use electronic labeling for the equipment in place of affixing physical labels to the equipment. The FCC has provided guidance regarding when and how a device's electronic display may be used to convey certain required information. And presently, the KDB 78474 it allows electronic display of the ID, the logo, um, and any other information required by the rules to be on the surface of the product. The proposal will allow any RF device equipped with an integrated display screen to display on the display the FCC ID warning statements and other information um, that would otherwise normally be shown on the physical label attached to the device. The rules do not change the requirements to place warning statements or other information on the device packaging or in user manuals or to make the information available at the point of sale. For measurement procedures, they propose to eliminate unnecessary or duplicative rules and consolidate the rules from various specific rule parts into the equipment authorization rules in part two. Um, they also bring to our attention that the ANSI C63.26 um, standard is pending release, and that addresses compliance testing for licensed radio devices. That's also another one that should be recognized um, by the FCC and codified. For importation, they're looking to eliminate unnecessary or duplicative rules and consolidate rules from various rule parts. Discontinue the requirement that importers file of FCC Form 740 with Customs and Border Protection for RF devices that are imported into the U.S. They're 
Modification of customs bonded warehouse requirement is also addressed, and they're increasing um, the number of trade show devices that are allowed um, to be imported. They outline which devices are excluded from the rules and devices imported for personal use are also um, addressed. So in summary, they are continuing to update KDB publications, currently considering petitions for reconsideration and clarification. And um, the, this presentation is a summary of some of the topics being proposed. The docket does have more detailed information um, in terms of the second notice of proposed rulemaking, those comments and reply comment periods are um, now complete, but the orders are all available, um, the notice for viewing as well. Now looking at some of the technical updates by the FCC, we start with the DFS. There's an update for DFS in terms of BIN 5 radar chirp. The chirp may partially fall outside of the channel radar detection bandwidth, and there was cited an issue in the um, detection near the edge of the radar detection bandwidth. And this raised the issue of the percentage of the chirp spectrum falling within the radar detection bandwidth for successful detection. And so they have an interim so, um, solution that they have outlined in the publication 905462D02. Uh, they outlined that the center frequency for each of the 30 trials of the BIN-5 radar shall be randomly se selected within 80% of the occupied bandwidth. They've outlined some interim solution requirements based on what they've seen, and they're outlining that for BIN-5, the old method of radar detection bandwidth of 80% of the occupied bandwidth should be used. And these frequencies must be randomized for all 30 trials. And the um, randomized test frequencies for BIN-5 must be included and outlined in the DFS test report. This requirement has been in effect um, since July 1st, so needs to be effective for applications that are submitted now. So they proposed that solution, and this is um, published for comment. There is a transition period that will be announced after the final adoption of the procedure. And they have outlined three subset of trials that will be performed with a minimum of 10 trials per subset. So in subset one, there's um, 10 trials randomized bin five where the center frequency of the device channel is used. In subset two, it's tuned frequencies such 90% of the long pulse Type 5 frequency modulation is within the low edge of the equipment occupied bandwidth. And in subset 3, the tune frequencies such that 90% of the long pulse type 5 frequency modulation is within the high edge of the equipment occupied bandwidth. Um, they also provided significant updates of various other types of devices, but just a quick summary. Um, for white space devices, these were previously known as PV band devices, so there's a change of terminology there. KDB 416721D01 will be modified to incorporate the rules adopted on August 6, 2015, um, which includes devices for unlicensed white space operation in the TV bands as well as in the 600 megahertz band. For wireless microphones in ET docket 1599 and 15100, they updated the rules for Part 15 unlicensed and Part 74 licensed wireless microphones. With a look at operation of licensed and unlicensed uh, devices in TV bands and operation of 600 megahertz service band. For Part 96 citizen broadband radio service, there's also updates on the technical rules around that for the radio, equipment authorization, interface requirements, and various other requirements as well. For medical body area network devices and bands, there was a report and order issued in May 2012, which um, looked at modifying Part 95 med radio rules and enabling deployment of M-band devices in the 2360 to 2400 megahertz. And furthermore, there was a second report and order in August 2014 that was released, which modified the definitions of healthcare facility 
and remove the antenna height restrictions in specifically the band 2360 to 2390 megahertz. A KDB publication 670572D01 was published as draft on October 15, 2015 that provides guidance on the test procedures and EMC requirements and this is also being updated as useful comments are being received. Next, we look at the module update. There have been several queries around this recently, um, but in most part, a lot of the guidance is actually more of a clarification and bringing to attention more of the requirements for host and module manufacturers. KDB996369 is the module transmitter guidance document. And um, there used to be several question and answers inside this publication. Those have been moved to a separate document now in the D02 um, version document now. So D01 contains the module transmitter guide. D02 is the module question and answer now. They've added clear guidance for host manufacturers who integrate multiple modules that can transmit simultaneously in terms of guidance for EMC and RF exposure requirements that need to be met. The guidance is based on presentations from 2013 in a module presentation. Um, they also, in April 2015, provided um, a couple of slides on the rules for host manufacturers of devices incorporating modules. They have in the D01 document added a section which addresses guidance for host manufacturers using modules. So that should be um, reviewed. And um, they've added a question 12 for multiple transmitters that transmit simultaneously for EMI considerations where there's no RF exposure or SAR evaluation. And they've also added a question 13, um, which looks at guidance for combining or co-locating transmitters for RF exposure evaluation requirements. They've also added a question 14, can a host manufacturer integrate a non-modular approved transmitter? So these are all very useful um, scenarios to look at and um, do form the FCC rules. So permit but ask is now the um, pre-approval guidance procedure and um, they just wanted to bring to attention a couple of the key um, clarifications based on questions they uh, receive. So if you're producing base stations as an example, a multi-carrier base station not supporting carrier aggregation is not subject to a pre-approval guidance procedure. Um, but the filing must attest if it is an LTE 3GPP device that the um, carrier aggregation is not supported and a grant condition that a class two permissive change must be applied if they are going to activate carrier aggregation. So that's a TCB requirement. Um, any multi-carrier base station, however, that does support carrier aggregation, that's 3GPP LTE, uh, transmit carrier aggregation is, however, subject to a pre-approval guidance procedure. So this is more of a reminder for manufacturers. And end product supporting LTE and other um, radio technologies such as GSM or wireless LAN, which are either standalone or using modules, um, there is a um, query around do we have to submit EMC radio parameter test data with all technologies active. And so that's addressed in question answer 12 of the module transmitter guide. So we need to do an assessment as to whether there's additional emissions generated. Um, and if not, then there's no, no requirement to file. However, an assessment does need to be made. And that guidance is also available through TIFSID. Now we'll look at some of the ANSI um, C63 standard activities briefly. Um, there was an incorporation into the rules um, of two C63 standards. 
um, after the report and order. There's the C63.4-2014 ANSI standard for uh, measurement of radio noise emissions uh, from 9 to four, uh, 9 kilohertz to 40 gigahertz. That's been codified and incorporated by reference, as well as C63.10-2013, which is for compliance testing of unlicensed wireless devices. There was a new stand, a couple of new standards pending publication. Um, there is the C63.26 for uh, compliance testing of licensed radio service, which of course provides um, acceptable measurement procedures for testing to the licensed radio service rule parts. They are seeking comment on whether to incorporate it by reference into the Part 2 rule, which um, should occur. Um, in terms of um, continued and planned standards, the, um, they are continuing to work on two draft standards, the first being C63.29, which is a draft for compliance testing of lighting products, and then C63.30, which is compliance testing of wireless power transfer products. So next is a technical update for wireless power transfer guidance. KDB Publication 68010601 provides guidance on wireless power transfer. Um, they have proposed revisions to the RF exposure analysis for these wireless power transfer devices, as well as revisions on the EMC procedures and limit interpretations. For EMC, they are um, clarifying um, that uncontained far-field radiative wireless power transfer that occurs at a distance is not considered to generate and use local RF energy. So that's clarification, which is um, also discussed in Rule Part 18.107. And EMC radiated measurements must provide sufficient data to qualify for extrapolation factors other than those that are used, um, prescribed in Rule Part 1531. Um, and the procedures uh, prescribed in 15.31 F2 and MP5. But the procedures that are used uh, must be consistent with the rule part that is being applied, whether it's Part 15 or 18. For RF exposure, the desktop style wireless power transfer system that operate at frequencies higher than 1.34 megahertz are likely required to require simulation, um, so numerical simulation or some simulation of some sort to show compliance due to the exponential decrease in MPE limits at that frequency as indicated in Rule Part 1.1310. Uh, they do say low power systems may meet MPE limits when the form factor and use case merit longer distance testing than what is specified in paragraph 33 of KDB publication 680106. But OEMs are responsible for justifying such test cases. The RF exposure testing described in the paragraph 33 of the publication should be conducted using an isotropic field probe. Loop measurements are not considered satisfactory to show compliance with the limits prescribed in 1.1310 for most wireless power transfer devices. Um, the FCC um, do um, understand that the existing rule parts are not explicitly designed for the more novel and the breadth of wireless power transfer devices that are entering the market. And so should the existing rule parts be deemed insufficient or disagreeable to OEMs or interested parties, it's recommended that the parties file a petition for rulemaking with the FCC in lieu of submitting general comments or critiques. And that includes RF exposure limits below 100 or 300 kilohertz. As a note, the ANSI C63.30 committee is working on radiated EMC measurement procedures for wireless power transfer devices. And upon adoption by ANSI, they will be incorporated into the guidance. All right, next is a brief update on RF exposure. 
And some of the topics that were covered by the FCC include a general kitty publication update, the product platform procedure update, updates on technology-specific procedures, RF exposure numerical simulation, SAR measurement system and methodologies, and miscellaneous updates. In this presentation, due to time restriction, we're only going to look at KD publication updates, and details on the rest are available um, upon request. So for KDE publications, um, they have updated all of the um, KDBs to update the language from PBA to PAG. So if pre permit but ask is now the pre approval guidance procedure, so there's an update for that. Um, they've also um, updated the KDBs so that anywhere they have cited that approvals need to be filed at the FCC has been revised um, to remove that requirement and the TCBs will be doing all of the approvals. The um, version of the IEEE standard 1528 has been updated from 2003 to 2013 to align with the test lab and TCB accreditation KDB guidance. And the fundamental measurement concepts in 2013 for the head SAR are applied in conjunction with published KDB procedures. So the KDB guidance does now supersede the IEEE 1528 2013 as the 1528 supported head SAR measurement only. And applicable procedures have already been integrated in the KDB guidance and also technology and product specific test procedures, equipment certification, and other general testing policies are only available in the FCC's KDB guidance. Various updates to the KDBs for the language change and IEEE 1528 updates and editorial changes. So there's the list of some various affected KDBs there. And a breakdown of some of the specific changes in the individual KD publications was also provided, some to um, correct some uh, anomalies, and some to provide um, updates based on their um, studies and observations, uh, and some clarifications and uh, cleanup as well. They've addressed, for example, um, TDD and uh, NS signaling and test channel requirements for wide frequency bands in the LTE test KDB. It included channel bandwidth and selection details for delta carry aggregation power measurement requirements. In the cell phone KDB, they've updated the text to match recent generation smartphones. Um, and they've also expanded procedures to cover QI, PMA, and A4 wireless power transfer devices. They also provided a lot of updates on some different um, platform types and technologies as well. So they've addressed some updates for mobile device exposure evaluation and applicable test desk distances for that evaluation. Also for um, GMRS, FRS, and PTT radios. There's also updates on the A4 wireless power star and field measurements and wireless charging devices evaluation. Um, also, guidance on implant SAR test exclusion, um, dynamic antenna tuner, diversity antennas, and wristwatches and head mounted devices, and also LTE unlicensed. All right, next we'll move on to Industry Canada updates. Um, starting with administrative updates. Um, there was a new Spectral Web Certification Registration tool that was released um, early in the year, earlier in the year. Um, but one of the updates um, in regard was the update actually affected both radio and terminal equipment devices. Um, there was a Telecommunication Act amendment that was implemented on September 30th, 2015. And so the telecommunication um, regulations have merged into the Telecommunication Act. And the previously known terminal equipment list, TEL, has changed to the Telecom Apparatus Register, the TAR TAR. There's no change when submitting terminal registration applications. All terminal equipment is now listed in the TAR list 
The TAR simply gives more legal significance, however, when Industry Canada is dealing with compliance enforcement. Some status information on RFP 100 issue 11, because these were supposed to be released, and also DC01. Um, RFP 100 and DC01 were not ready for publication when the new um, Spectra Web application was launched in March 2015. They were supposed to be simultaneously launched. Um, additional industry comments were received in the spring, which delayed the publication. Um, they were on the queue for publication and was published, was pushed to late summer. They are expected to be published soon after the new government will be elected, which um, as per guidance, the current issue or draft issue rules can be followed. So any rules that were provided in the April 2015 or the previous um, workshop as well can be followed if they referred to these latest version of the standards until the official publications. Um, they also provided some guidance on MIMO and Smart Antenna Assessment in RSS 247 Annex A. RSS 247, of course, looks at um, sort of the 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz wireless LAN devices and Bluetooth and Bluetooth low energy, et cetera. Um, there was a procedure in Annex A of the standard that was developed um, which looked at the use of high-gain directional antennas. Um, and for MIMO, they outline that each antenna may be evaluated separately with the limit reduced by 10 log n, where n is the number of antennas. For smart antenna design, they outline that any steerable antennas must be evaluated at all combinations of steerable elevation. For circular polarity, they say they can be used as normal and measured um, using a linear polarized antenna. Industry Canada does realize that the guidance may result in a very conservative um, set of evaluations, but currently this is required and they need to evaluate the impacts further on. If you joined the April um, FCC and IC updates webinar, you would have seen the Industry Canada. Um, we presented a walkthrough through their new database. Um, but here, just as a brief refresh refresher, um, there, is a, there are several links here which look at the um, new website that they have for radio and telecom equipment. The e-filing page on their website is a link to that, um, to their Spectra Web Online Services. Um, and the various search tools you're used to are also listed on the web page there. There are slides provided here. If you do need to register your um, user account or a new company or update your information, there is some slides here provided that um, show where the login and registration um, sections are, what it looks like. The previous links should take you roughly to the right place. If not, um, the navigation, these slides um, help here to access your web account. Um, and as I say, if you're, if you're a new user, how to register for a user account for the first time. Um, this walks you through whether you're an existing applicant or a new applicant, an agent, or, or a certification body. So these are actually provided just for information. You can see here if you're a new applicant, if you wish to create a user account, you work for a company and never never registered before with Industry Canada and was never issued with a company number, and you wish to create your company record, obtain a company number, and link your user account to your company number. Um, so you can do a registration if you fall into those categories as a new applicant. And then takes you through um, what you need to enter in terms of account numbers and business names and passwords. Um, and a couple of hints in terms of your company, whether which option to choose um, as well. So this presentation will be provided. So I just wanted to step through those um, to save time there. 
The system um, that Industry Canada have released, the Spectre Web, does include identification fields for product identification, which are going to be applicable in the future publication of RSP 100 Issue 11, because currently we're at Issue 10. And Issue 10 specifies a requirement that the model number needs to be identified by the applicant. Issue 11 does modify that so that there are um, various fields that can be recorded at the model level. The certification number, the IC ID as it's referred to um, frequently, is recorded at the family level. So the IC ID concept still remains the same. Um, but in terms of the model, um, they refer to a product marketing name as a P, the PMN as a name used to identify the certified product, whether it's a final product or module. They also have a reference to HMN, which is host marketing name, which is applicable only for modules when a host is applicable. So if there's a module and there's a host applicable in the authorization, we use the host name to identify the host in which a module is being certified and will be integrated. Um, now, the next to HFIN and FFIN, HFIN is the hardware version identification number, and this replaces the model number concept. It's meant to be a reference to the technical specifications of a model in a family. Um, the product marketing name can be used in place of an HFIN if the manufacturer does not have a specific hardware version identification number. Now, many manufacturers are known to already print a number on the product surface to identify the specific hardware version. And sometimes those could be a serial number or a part number, so those can be identified as the HBIN, as Industry Canada does not want manufacturers to have to put excess information or um, unnecessary additional information on the product. The next item is the FBIN, the firmware version identification number is a reference to the specific firmware of a model. And Industry Canada is interested in the firmware number that affects the RF. So the product firmware or the radio firmware can be used. Um, the FVIN is not required to be on the external surface of the device if it's provided electronically. If there is no firmware version identification number, then you would enter not applicable in our application form. In terms of the types of online applications, Again, this might be a refresher for some of you, but it is applicable in the forthcoming RSP 100 Issue 11. Um, there is still going to be a new single product certification registration type of application, and that's where there's a new radio terminal or dual application for only one product version. So you do a single certification application in that case. A new family certification is where there's a new radio terminal um, where there's multiple product versions applicable within the new family. If there's already been a certification and now there's a new product to be added to a previously approved certification and this um, new product meets the Class 1 permissive change or Class 2 permissive change provisions, so the difference between this model and the previous sorry, this product and a previous product um, is minimal, then the application type would be called add new product to existing certification. And so we would have multiple product versions existing then in the family. They do introduce for product modifications, which is also referred to previously as reassessment. Um, they have class one permissive changes and class two permissive changes, but they now introduce class three permissive change and class four permissive change um, more clearly. They outline this is where there's a product, um, there's a radio been produced for an existing product version which requires a reassessment due to a firmware change would be a class three permissive change. If the, if the reassessment is for integration of a module into a host, then that is going to be known as a class four permissive change. So it's a certified module going to be integrated in a host. There's a class, there's a need for an approval. That's a class four permissive change. The next approval type is multiple listing, which remains the same as the previous issue. 
stainless where you're producing a radio for a new certification product version based on an existing product version that's certified under a different applicant for which you wish to obtain your own certification um, with the necessary agreement from the original application. And you'll be um, using the same applicant to create a new certification number based on a previous one. Could be for marketing purposes, for example. There's also going to be application type of a partial transfer of certification where you're producing a radio for a new certification product version based on an existing version certified under a different applicant which you um, wish to obtain exclusive rights and responsibility for offering this product on the market. The final type is a company takeover, full transfer of a certification um, where you're requesting transfer of ownership of a company based on a company takeover agreement. Next, we'll look at the standard activity updates for Industry Canada as they presented. So we first look at the RSS updates. In July 2015, they um, released some RSS 139 issue 3 for AWS, where they have um, extended the frequency bands for AWS to incorporate more LTE bands. RSS 170 has also uh, been released up issue to issue 3, which looks at mobile earth stations. RSS 310 issue 4 was also re released for license exempt radio apparatus. Uh, previously in May, they released RSS 119 issue 12 for land mobile radio. RSS 247 issue 1 was a significant release in May for DTS, FHS, and license exempt um, wireless land devices. Those were in effect, or are in effect, so need to be met. Uh, soon to be published, RSS 247 Issue 1, Amendment 1, clarifies rules for equipment with overlapping bandwidth between two different Wi-Fi bands, clarifies measurement methods for Wi-Fi devices to harmonize with the FCC requirements, specifies requirements for emissions falling within restricted frequency bands, and specifies that antenna elevation mass requirements apply to outdoor fixed equipment operating in 5250 to 5350 megahertz. The changes have already been posted in CB Notice 2015-07 that was released July 14, 2015. Um, RSS 216 Issue 2 is due to be released um, for wireless chargers, includes technical updates, and the scope has been expanded to cover all wireless power transfer devices. RSS 131 Issue 3 is also due to be released for zone enhancers for the land mobile service. There was an um, outstanding issue in terms of the um, registration database for the consumer zone enhancers. Um, they are going to list acceptable FCC KDBs because the FCC do have their own um, various uh, booster KDBs that are already um, quite substantially outlined. RSP 100 issue 11, as mentioned, is also due for release. And here is a list of some of the RSSs that are currently in revision. Um, RSS 220 for ultra-wideband technologies under review. RSS 210 for license-exempt radio equipment. They're looking to clean up the annexes that have been relocated or removed. Furthermore, incorporate amendments to the RSS and review the technical requirements. RSS 117 for LAN and code station transmitters operating in 200 to 535 kilohertz is also um, being revised. Um, RSS 125 for LAN mobile and fixed radio transmitters and receivers from the 1.705 to 50 megahertz range um, are also under review, as well as um, RSS 134 issued to for 900 megahertz narrowband personal communication service. RSS 102 Issue 5 was released in March 2015, um, which is um, radio frequency exposure compliance for radio communication devices. Um, 
And they have uh, included uh, the latest FCCKD pub, uh, procedures for STAR, and this is a list that outlines which KDBs from the FCC are acceptable by Industry Canada. Um, so the ones in blue are some of the more recent um, incorporations, which you can see here. There's STAR test 3G devices, hotspot STAR, Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi is the most recent one that the FCC released um, just a few months ago which includes the 802.11a and 802.11ac Wi-Fi devices. Um, push to talk has also been accepted. Um, and there's a link there to the list of acceptable FCC KDBs for SAR there. So the RF evaluation limits, when does it apply? Um, March 19, the standard was published, so there was a 180-day transition period only for um, non-peripheral um, nerve stimulation limits. Um, so after the publication under RSS 102 Issue 5, there's no need to reassess if your device has already been granted certification prior to the publication of the standard. Um, due to the RF evaluation limits. However, the compliance distance in the user manual may need to be revisited because the limits are actually more tighter for RF evaluation. So all necessary steps do need to be taken to ensure that devices still comply with the latest version of RSS 102, including the safety code limits. Um, compliance is an ongoing obligation, and so it is the responsibility of the manufacturers to ensure that the devices they're manufacturing, importing, or selling do still comply with the safety code limits at all times. For all new certifications, compliance does need to be demonstrated according to the latest issue five, um, including family certifications requ requested after the date of the publication of RSS 102 issue five. So here, this just shows some of the field strength limits below 10 megahertz for electric and magnetic field. Um, they outline some limits here for nerve stimulation and SAR. There is a new release, um, Issue 1, SPR-002, which looks at supplementary procedures for assessing compliance to the peripheral nerve stimulation limits. Um, and there's a consultation ongoing and the date of publication is to be determined. And there's just a look at the contents of the new standard, tells of the um, sort of test equipment required, the measurement methods, the hierarchy, um, and just basically the annexes for the assessment. So the peripheral nerve stimulation limits, this shows some of the um, the development of the standard and the date of applicability in the transition period, um, as well as that's applicable for your device. RSS 216 issue true a draft for wireless power transfer devices. The consultation is closed and the date of publication is also to be determined. Um, this is just a summary of changes. They have changed the title. The transition period of six months is provided or either issue one or two could be used. This, as mentioned, it covers all types of wireless power transfer devices. Um, and the new issue differentiates between three different types of wireless power transfer subassemblies um, sub based on their classification as radio apparatus, either category one or two, or interference causing equipment. So it's more specified and easier to follow and more prescribed. They have added test methods and arrangements of the equipment under test which are specific to these types of wireless power transfer devices. So these are the three types. Type 1 is subassemblies that are ISM equipment. Type 2, which are Category 2 radio apparatus, which do not require certification. And uh, Category 1 radio apparatus, which do require uh, certification. So it outlines technical requirements other than RF exposure, um, again differentiated based on subassembly type, RF exposure requirements, and certification and labeling requirements as well. In terms of the interference causing equipment standards, 
They've newly published ISIS 008, which is for cable distribution systems. They will soon publish the latest version of the RF lighting devices, ISIS 005, uh, which covers all lighting products that generate unwanted radio frequency interference and includes existing requirements from the earlier issue for non-gas discharge products, as well as alternative requirements based on CISPR-15. ISIS-003, Issue 6, is also soon to be published for ITE equipment, including digital apparatus, um, where they clarify the definition of an ITE device to include storage media and the applicability of broadcast equipment. They also clarify the use of ANSI C63.4 as a measurement standard. So for lighting equipment, ISIS 005 um, was due July 10th, 2015 uh, for consultation. The data publication is to be determined. There's a transition period once published of 12 months that will be applicable. The scope has been broadened to cover all lighting products capable of generating unwanted emissions that may cause RF interference. And for test methods, it does include alternative compliance verification test method, method and corresponding limits, which are based on CISPR 15. And they do provide two alternatives, as mentioned, for the technical um, requirements. Um, okay, so there's further details if you are a manufacturer of lighting uh, devices to read very carefully um, which method is applicable based on your type of uh, device. And that concludes this session of FCC and Industry Canada updates. Um, thank you for joining.